Good evening. I am Dr. Subir Javeri, a consultant spine surgeon from Ahmedabad. I would like to thank ASSI and its current team members for having given me the opportunity to present and share with you the research that has evolved and changed my practice. Thoracolumbar fractures is one of the most common entities that we encounter in our trauma rooms. Uh, this is one entity that is of immense interest to the orthopedic surgeon, the spine surgeon, as well as the neurosurgeon. Significant variability exists in its assessment, as well as the evolution of various treatment protocols. However, in the last two decades, there has been a quantum jump in their understanding, as well as its management. Dennis, in 1983, modified the two column concept into the three column concept. And he gave the basic modes of failure of the three columns. And based on that devised four major types of spinal injuries, the compression injuries, the burst injuries, the seat belt varieties, what later it came to be known as the flexion distraction injuries. And there was the fracture dislocation injuries. And depending upon the column involvement, he gave these nine varieties. Almost 11 years after Dennis, in 1994, a group of stalwarts from the AO Spine Group, Magral, Max AB, Gerdsbein, Joseph Harms, they came together and developed what came to be known as the AO Spine Magral Thoracolumbar Fracture Classification. They analyzed 1,445 cases and gave a mechanism of injury and a pathomorphological criteria depending upon which they described nine various types of injuries. These were progressively increasing in severity and complexity. So type A1 to A3 were compression injuries, B1 to B3 were the distraction injuries, and C1 to C3 involved them, those with multidirectional as well as translational injuries. They also give prognostic criteria in terms of the healing potential of these injuries. At the same time, two gentlemen, Thomas McCormick, Robert Gaines, and Karai Kovic, together came to, came to show what came to be known as the load sharing classification of spine fractures. They retrospectively evaluated 28 of their operated fractures. These were already operated with steffy plates, one level above and one level below. They had also done postural bone grafting and followed them up for three to four years. However, what they noticed was that 10 out of 28 of their patients had broken implants. What they actually did was that they reviewed their preoperative CT scan and X-rays and based on that, devised a point-based system for calculating the injury score. The first group was that group A with vertebral body combination on a sagittal reconstruction and anything with less than 30% was given one mark, one point, with 30 to 60% two points and greater than 60% was given three points. Then the group B was those with an opposition of the vertebral body fragments on axial scans and those with less than one millimeter displacement or is given one point. Those with more than two millimeter displacement but involvement of less than 50% of the surface was given two points. And those with greater than two millimeter displacement involving more than 50% of the entire area were given three points. The third was a correction of kyphosis on comparing the pre and the post of x-rays. And this was anything less than three degrees of correction was given one point. Between four to nine degrees correction, two points. And more than 10 degrees were given three points. Based on these nine variations, they devised what would be the score or could be known, came to be known as the load sharing score. And the maximum uh, score would be nine. And the minimum would be three. And in their results, they evaluated that their 10 out of 28 had screw failures, 
Now, all these 10 had scores of 7 points or more. 5 of these 10 had scores of 9 points. All the remaining 18, which did not have any score failures, had scores of 6 or less. So, they deduced that greater the comminution and displacement of fragments, it prevented the proper healing and does not allow the bone to transfer the load. Hence, the total load is then borne by the implant, which eventually results in implant failure. Based on that, they recommended that short segment fixation is okay for patients with scores of 6 or less. But those with scores of 7 or more require a second stage anterior reconstruction. However, if we look at the entire paper, there are a few caveats. This paper does define the possibility of failure following short segment fixation. However, and it also advocates a second stage anterior surgery after already having conducted a posterior surgery. This uh, classification cannot be used as is preoperatively to decide the type of surgery. But it does provide us with a sense as to when to consider an anterior surgery as a first alternative or to consider doing a cage reconstruction from the back. This paper actually influenced my thought processes significantly in undertaking anterior surgery in many traumatic cases, especially those with an intact neurology. So we have seen this X-ray before, a burst fracture, anterior and as well as posterior uh, vertebral columns. And if you look at the uh, PLC, it's involved. And this was what was done was an anterior as well as a posterior fixation in this patient. Now, by the time I began to understand the load sharing classification, Alex Vaccaro and the AO Spine Trauma Study Group came up with a very comprehensive classification of thoracolumbar fractures. It was easy to use and remember. It helped in the decision-making process and it actually enumerated the points that were used by the surgeons to decide the treatment and give a numerical value to these important points. This classification became popular as the TLX classification and they developed three independent variables which define the outcome. The morphology of the fracture, the integrity of the PLC, and the neurological status. They gave an increasing score to a greater degree of injury or importance of preservation of neurology. And this was very useful in the decision making. They used a multitude of injury morphometries, but there were three broad groups. The compression group, which involved the axial, the lateral, the flexion compression. Then there was the translational or the rotational group, and then there was the distraction group, which would be the flexion distraction or the extension distraction. Now, if you take a look at the point system, any compression fracture was given one point. Those with a burst component would get an additional one point. Those with a translational or a rotational injury were given three points. And those with a distraction injury were given four points. The PLC integrity was the next assessed. If it was intact, zero points. If it was injured clearly, three points. But if it was suspected or maybe indeterminate, then there would be two points given to that as well. Next was the neurological status of the patient. If it was intact, zero. If the patient had a nerve root problem, then the patient would be given two points. If there was a cord or a conus medullus injury, but it was complete, then only two points were awarded. But if it was incomplete, then three points were awarded. And a quadricoina injury with a potential to recover was straight away given three points. Based on these recommendations, if you compile the score, then any patient having a score of three or less would undergo a non-surgical treatment. Those with five or more would definitely require surgical management. And those with four points was considered equivocal and the surgeon uh, who was the treating physician at the point was supposed to decide on, on a case-to-case -case basis.
They also mentioned a multitude of local and regional fracture factors, such as a sternal or a rib fracture, overlying burns, extreme kyphosis or prolapse, open fractures, which may be relevant in decision making at that time. And they also suggested the surgical approach. Now to determine a surgical approach, they decided on the neurological status and the PNC only. So if the patient was intact, a posterior approach, regardless of the PNC. A root injury, posterior approach, regardless of the PNC. It was only in the incomplete spinal cord injury or the cord in patients with an intact PNC that they recommended an interior approach. Or if the patient had a disrupted PNC, then it was a front and a back combined approach. All complete patients with spinal cord injury or cord equina were recommended a posterior approach only. So the authors here feel that these two determinants, the neurologic status and the PLC, are independent of the morphology of the injury and they are what decide the approach. So if you take a look at the entire thought processes of these authors, the morphology decides whether you want to operate or not. And based on the neurology and the PLC, you tend to decide whether what approach to be taken. So this was a very comprehensive methodology that they have used and was very simple to use and remember. In the same context, the patient, they have also mentioned that the principles of a surgical approach cannot be substituted for a surgeon's experience with a given approach as it is conceded that various approaches may be used successfully to treat injuries to the thoracolumbar spinal cord. There is no treatment algorithm that can supersede a surgeon's intuition in prioritizing and integrating a multitude of complex clinical and biomechanical issues. So let's take a quick look at one case of mine. So this was a young male first year engineering student who fell from a height of over 15 feet, presented to me with paraparesis and a conus medullary injury. This was his NMRI, a burst fracture, significant injury, more than 50% retropulsion of the bone into the lower uh, spinal cord or the conus medullaris. This was a CT scan and you can see the degree of bony retropulsion into the canal. So if you take a look at the Stelex score, he had a burst fracture, two points, incomplete neurology with conus medullary injury, three points, and an indeterminate PLC, another two points, giving him a score of total seven, and recommendation would be operative in this patient. What I did, well, I reconstructed him anteriorly with a mesh cage, iliac crest bone graft and did not supplement him with a posterior because he had most likely an indeterminate neurology uh, uh, PLC injury and the anterior distraction that I was able to achieve gave a sufficient lock of the facets posteriorly. This patient at five years follow-up is fully recovered, has normal bladder bowel and penile function and has completed college and is employed now. So fabulous uh, outcome from a surgical standpoint as well as from a, from a patient standpoint as well. So if we take a look at my, what I feel about the TLX classification is that it is very useful to document the injury. It has helped decide me when to undertake surgery. It, for deciding on whether to go interior or not, I looked at a combination of the TLX along with the load sharing classification. I had the combination with involvement of both end plates as well as the posterior uh, cortex, such as in a burst fracture, prompted me to undertake an anterior reconstruction in many patients. An incomplete neurology helped decide in favor of an anterior approach based on the TLX, obviously. And my practice evolved based on a combination of these two papers the TLX and the load shedding classification. Just about the time when like, you know, I was able to gather that, yes, now I know how to treat these thoracolumbar fractures. Alex Vaccaro and his colleagues in the AO Spinal Cord Injury and Trauma Knowledge Forum came up with the 
new geo classification 2013 they modified the telix classification and based on three character characteristics one was the morphology of the fracture two was the neurological status of the patient and three they added a few clinical modifiers so in general those patients with a type a were the compression fractures with an intact tension bed Type B was those patients who had a tension band failure, either anterior or posterior. And type C were all patients who had a failure of all the components with either a translation or a dislocation. Based on that, they have devised this new classification. A0 is minor or non-structural fractures, especially those involving the spinous process or the transverse process. A1 is a wedge compression fracture involving either the superior or the inferior end plate. A2 is a split fracture involving both the superior and the inferior, but without involvement of the posterior cortex. A3 is an incomplete burst where either the superior or inferior end plate with involvement of the posterior cortex is present. And A4 is where all three are involved in the sense that there is a superior end plate, inferior end plate, and posterior cortex involvement. Type B are the distraction injuries, as we just saw. A uh, patient having a complete transosseous tension bend dis disruption or a chance fracture would be a B1 category. Those with a posterior tension bend disruption would be a B2 category. And those with an hyperextension or an extension distraction injury would be a type B3 injury. Those with any type of displacement, dislocation, translation, rotation, would be considered as a type C injury. The neurological status was also given a significant importance in this classification as well. And the N0 was a neurological intact patient. N1 was a transient neurologic deficit, but none at present. N2 was a radiculopathy. N3 is an incomplete spinal cord injury or an uh, cord equina injury. N4 would be a complete spinal cord injury, what was classically known as an ACIA category. And NX is whenever the patient cannot be examined because of head traumas or polytrauma, intoxication, intubation, etc. They added two clinical modifiers. One was M1, where the PLC is indeterminate on an MRI and it may influence the surgical decision. And an M2, where there were patient specific modifiers such as angst bond or dish or rheumatoid osteoporosis or burns over the spine. Those were the cases of an M2 variety, such as this case of an angst bond and the patient was ambulatory after the surgery. They also devised what came to be known as the algorithm for the morphology classification. And uh, based on this algorithm, the surgeon has uh, he's presented with the films, either the CT scan or the X-rays, should first look for any dislocation. If there is a dislocation, it's a straightforward C injury. If there is no dislocation, then look for the tension band injury. If it is an anterior tension band injury, then it's a B3 variety. Or if it's a posterior tension band injury, then whether there is any ligamentous disruption, then it will be B2. If there is no ligament and only bony tension band disruption, then it is a B1 category. On the Going back to the tension band, if there is no tension band injury, look for the vertebral body fracture. Now, with the vertebral body fracture, look for the involvement of the posterior vertebral wall. If there is a posterior vertebral wall involvement, then it's a bust fracture. And then look for involvement of the end plates. If both are involved, it's a complete bust. If only one is involved, it is an incomplete burst or an A3. If there is no burst fracture, that means the posterior wall is not involved. Then look at the end plates again. If both are involved, then it's a pincer variety or the split variety B2. And if only one is involved, then it's a wedge compression fracture or A1 category. If you look at the vertebral body and there is no vertebral body fracture, there are only process fractures like the TP or the spinous process, and this is an A0 injury, which is insignificant.
Besides this surgical algorithm, they also came up later on in 2015 with what is known as the AO spine injury score for the, uh, the thoracolumbar fractures. And here they have graded these fractures like from A0 to A4 with gradually increasing numbers, type B tension band injuries, gradually increasing 5, 6, 7, and type C translation injuries giving almost the highest number, 8. Then the neurological status also was graded gradually with an increasing number. And patient specific modifiers were also given one mark depending upon the uh, modifier. Based on this, they again gave the recommendation that any patient with less than three was conservative, greater than five was operative. And with a score of four or five, the surgeon was supposed to decide absolutely what we see saw with the TLX classification. So if I if we, if we discuss my take on the AO classification, I found it to be a very comprehensive classification. Basically, it draws from the Dennis classification, the Magellan classification, the TLX classification. It has incorporated virtually everything, every other knowledge that has been previously known. I actually attempted using the AOSI score, but the TLX was far easier to remember. Any patient with significant combination or an incomplete neurology prompted me to consider an anterior surgery. However, if associated with a PLC injury, I would do a long segment posterior with reduction of the fracture fragments. And at times I've undertaken a posterior column shortening procedures in elderly patients wherever an anterior surgery was not feasible, such as in this case where you see the anterior height as well as the vertebral posterior body height are the same and there is no risk of getting any post-operative kyphosis or implant failure in this patient. By 2010, while these classifications were being evolved, another concept began to start flooding the uh, literature on thoracolumbar fractures and that was fixation of the intermediate screw or what came to be known as the posterior fixation of the fractured vertebrae or PFFV and various articles 2010 and then again by Rishi and Ajoy and Raj Shekharan in 2014 uh, demonstrated the advantage of putting in uh, two additional screws in the fractured vertebrae and how it prevented uh, future collapse and this actually these papers actually began to be the norm for short segment fixations and people began to incorporate the index uh, or the intermediate screws into the fractured vertebrae which helped in the short segment cases. And a concept that probably has you know evolved over the last two decades but has not really been at the forefront of discussion in thoracolumbar fracture forums is a known fusion. So I began to look at this aspect of the thoracolumbar fractures and I was surprised to find that these have been in contention for from 1999 when Sanderson first presented his paper on short segment fixations of thoracolumbar burst fractures without fusion. And the paper was actually a randomized control study by Li Yang Dai and they followed their patients for five to seven years. 2011 was another paper by Yang et al. And then there were many, many, many papers uh, in on this, this same topic. What they all came up with was that there was a reduced operative time and a reduced blood loss in patients where they did not undertake any fusion. However, few papers commented about implant removal and implant failure. Taking a look, a detailed look at a couple of papers, is that this paper by Li Yang Dai in 2011, uh, they took only the Dennis type B fractures with involvement of the superior end plate and those with a load sharing score of six or less. Then they randomized them into the fusion and non-fusion groups, followed them up for five to seven years. And then they show that whether it is a fusion group or a non-fusion group, there was minimal loss of kyphosis no difference in the local kyphotic angle and there were no implant failures. So technically both their groups did equally well provided they had a Dennis type B fracture 
or with a load sharing score of six or less. And hence they recommended non-fusion for selected thoracolumbar fractures. Another article by Yang et al. actually demonstrated excellent reconstitution and bone remodeling after temporary internal stabilization. They have gone ahead and removed all their implants and have shown excellent maintenance of their operated patients without any loss of kyphosis in these patients. Very interesting article by Chow et al. in 2016 was on the need of removal of implants after fixation of burst fractures without fusion. And what they showed was that one third of their patients in the retention group had implant failure. Obviously none in the removal group had implant failure because they were removed before they broke. They also showed that there was significant decline in the interior disc height in both the groups, the retention as well as the removal group. The local kyphotic angle also tended to increase gradually with time in both the groups. And at the end of five and a half years, they deduced that there was no difference between implant removal and implant retention in patients of burst fractures of the thoracic spine. This was also simultaneously uh, sort of attacked by the MIS guys. Uh, where they began putting in percutaneous implants without fusion in the thoracolumbar burst fractures. And paper after paper began to come for uh, in favor of MIS. But the gist of the matter was that all these papers eventually showed only one thing, that there was a reduced operative time, reduced blood loss, reduced hospital stay, and reduced rates of infection. I also continued to uh, follow these papers and added uh, percutaneous fixation for this patient of mine who had a B1 transosseous tension band injury, intact neurology, and fixed a patient without any intermediate screw. At the end of 28 months, she still has 22 degrees of local kyphotic angle. Uh, and implant re removal is being considered. So whenever one is faced with a plethora of literature, one has to look at a summary or a review, kind of a meta-analysis, which was done by Denise and Botelho in 2017 on this very topic. They took five randomized control trial, trials, and if you took, look at the sheer numbers, almost 1400 papers were assessed and out of which they removed the duplicates and they sent, they came down to five randomized control trials. And they showed that there was a reduced blood loss and surgical time with the non-fusion technique for thoracolumbar fractures. There was no difference in the loss of correction or an overall kyphosis in either case. And there was no advantage of performing any fusion. They also noted that there was a minimal increase in the segmental motion at the fracture site in the non-fusion group, which however was clinically and statistically insignificant. And the implant removal was required four times more in the non-fusion group. However, this could be due to cultural norms and there was limited data available. So if we try to decode the encrypted message that is being given, First, identify the type of fracture, decide on the type of treatment that you want to give, either conservative or operative, and you may use the TELIX or the AOSIS classification for that. Assess the potential for autofusion, the A1, A2, A3, and B1 categories, and in those cases, if you are operating, consider an MIS percutaneous fusion fixation. Add an intermediate screw if you're doing a short segment fixation because it is extremely beneficial to use this to, for preventing long-term kyphosis. If the patient presents with an incomplete neurology or a significant comminution as dictated by the load sharing classification, consider an anterior surgery. And use long segment uh, fixations. If, you're, uh, if your patient has a type C injury, 
or in cases where an anterior surgery is not feasible. Thank you very much. Although it was a little long topic, it was quite interesting to discuss and share with you. Thank you very much.